us like, give us the history of where we are right now. Well, this is the third Birchmere. And uh, my husband started the Birchmere 57, almost 58 years ago, when he was 23 years old. And he just had like a small lunch counter restaurant and he started having music on the weekends and then that got out of control for size wise so then they, he opened the third second birch mirror and then this is the third birch mirror that jimmy matthews built for him and in this fabulous building and these are all the acts that have played here over the years and i mean everybody you can imagine from chris christopherson ray charles you name it and they're all up on this wall where they've signed all the posters and everything to gary and it just lets you know what an iconic legendary place this is and it is continues to be that way because he built a great business with great people that work for him that keep it going they're the ones that keep it going so lucky i'm oddly part of it since gary passed away but it's still running strong if you could if you could even guess like how many acts in um, the years? I think it's been now over 3,000. And uh, Gary wrote a book about a, a year or so before he died. And he, a lot of the people that played here, he had interviewed. And I think it said something in the book that there were around 3,000 acts that had played here over those 56, 57 years. So a lot. And they come back because they love the fact that it's a listening room. And they love the fact that everything works and it's the best sound system, best lighting system, and they like that because I know that one of, one of the acts said, the first thing he asks when he goes into a new club, just show me what doesn't work. Because there's always something they have to figure out sound-wise, something doesn't work, and everything in here works. So, seems like it wouldn't be that big a deal, but it is. I mean, he could, my husband could walk in this place and go, with all the light bulbs out uh, that are in this building, and he could say, why is that light bulb all the way over there? out so he, it was really important to him that everything be working and the best so that's it the details mm -hmm. it's Those all details. in the details isn't it i love um gosh i love so many of them i love the kevin uh, bacon brothers and they're big here they come here a lot and um Vince Gill, i love so mostly country but it's odd that now we're not doing so much country. Oh, like we had the stylistics were just here. I love the stylistics. The Manhattans are coming. I love the Manhattans. So it's a lot of um, sort of more Motown sound as well as country. I think in the first years it was primarily country and bluegrass, but it's grown far beyond that now. And comedians. We have Paula Poundstone who comes two to three days a year and sells out. And you know, it's a very diverse group. Of entertainers. In the beginning when I would say, oh my God, Ben Skill's here, I'm going to stay and watch the show. And he would say, I've seen this a million times. I'll buy you the CD. I said, Gary, if everybody bought a CD, no one would be in here. And if I did sit for a show, it, I would make it about 15 minutes. And then in that dark room, you could see him sort of crouching down and he'd come over and say, are you ready to go? I go, he isn't even on stage yet. So yeah, it was interesting. He ran this by himself. Well, well, not by himself. He ran it with all the people that really run it, and that's your management staff. Oh my gosh. So he managed to build a very good team. Fortunately, I don't have to do very much when people ask me how much is involved in it. Very little, because he built such a great staff and such a great um, business that it runs itself. It's just, I, I come here and I call the numbers, and then I go home, and that's it. Maybe have a flat bread glass of wine. <laughs> so that's the extent of my involvement. And just trying to make sure that everybody's happy and feels like they have what they need. And that's it. But I love it. I do. And it sort of keeps me connected to him as well. And that's a good thing. Because right now, it's just me and the dog. Wilkes. Wilkes, the dog. He's been a very good, a very He's a very good great, dog. This is very unusual. I had been coming here for, I came to see every Vince Gill for years. Vince Gill show for years. And then, um, Gary's wait, uh, Dawn, who works for Gary, runs the wait set, called me years ago about having table covers built for all the tables. And I wasn't going to come over here because I've been here many times, but I thought with this many table covers, they're not going to pay the price for my workroom because they were a very custom drapery and upholstery workroom to high end designers. So I just wouldn't come over here. And they 
finally I came over because I was told I was being really rude. So when I came over and said, I think that the cost from our workroom is going to be high. You need to get something like this from China where they make a hundred of these at one time. And his response was that he wasn't on the welfare and just telling what it was going to cost. And that's how I met him. And then we reupholstered all his banquettes and that's how I met Gary. I come here and I'm here generally when they have sound check and you see how important the lighting is and people that run the sound board and run the lights and people that do the load in and get the acts in here. It, people think you just open the door and they walk in and get up on the stage. It's a lot more complicated than that. And I never really realized any of that. I think a lot of people probably don't. So when you see what goes in to the preparation that goes into having somebody on the stage for an hour, hour and a half, the, the preparation for it is probably two to three times that amount of time. And the other thing Gary did was offer, for especially in the early days when a lot of these bands traveled in big, big trucks and, and buses, he had a dressing, a dressing rooms for them and showers and a washer and dryers so the people that had been living on trucks, or not trucks, buses, could come in and take a shower and wash their clothes. And he really cared very much about the bands and about giving them, making them comfortable and feeling like this was a home away from home, which I think most of them do. When you step into this, you know, you have your own business. Yes. And, you know, you're stepping into this large also business and, you know, you're taking over and you give a lot of beautiful credit to this team um, that is here, you know, but you're jumping into the coaching role, really. Um, what are the challenges that go along with that? It's really not a challenge here at all because all the people that are here, I know I can depend on and go to if I need something. The challenge was that I was generally in my office till 6 or 6.30 because Gary would be here and then I, I always got home before he did. So now I, I was always an early riser anyway, so I can't do rush hour. So instead of being in my office at 4.30, I'm generally try to be there by 5 or 5.30, but then I have to leave to come here, so then I have to leave at like three o'clock to get deal with all the traffic, take him for a walk, and then change my clothes and get here. So it's a lot. I don't have a whole lot of free time anymore. But the good news is every single thing I do, from running my own business to to being here, are all things that I love. So that's okay. It's awful. I can't imagine people that get up every day and go, oh God, I don't want to go. And I love every day that I go to work. I love, but it's been hard to juggle everything. And the people that my clients have been more than patient because I could usually get a response and a proposal out in a heartbeat. And now they may wait two or three days because it's more on my plate than they used to be. But it's still fun. I get up every day and love what I do. So that's the good news. That's the good news. Feels like you don't work a day in that sense when you're doing something you love. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's the best advice. Yep. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And I think a lot of what helps is being busy. If you, if you stop moving, if you stop moving, your brain starts to work. I mean, just you're even asking me that. But um, I think that's helped a lot because I didn't even have time really to think about it. And um, we had a huge celebration of his life at the Birchmere after his funeral service. And to see all the people that came here that just loved him. And they were people that came to the shows that loved him and every night that I'm here, several people every night will come up and talk about how much they loved Gary. And so that helps too. So to me, he's still very much a presence. You said you so feel That's the good news, yeah. You feel him here? And I've got all these cardboard cutouts all over the place that remind me of him as well. You see him, you feel him, yeah. and you feel his, like the legacy of oh. this place. Oh yeah, and there are a lot of things that I do here now that I think He's up there going, no, no, that, no. <laughs> so that keeps it fun too, just knowing that he's up there looking down going, no, and I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> it's my decision now. I'm here now, okay? <laughs> this is how I think it should have been done. <laughs> and I'm going to change the tablecloth too while I'm at it. There you go. It's like, what, what would we see and feel if we were here to catch on a show? Well, I also the, I think one of the things that you feel when you hear is a number of people, a lot of the people that come here often know other people that come here all the time. So you actually see a lot of interaction from the people that are coming here to see a show. And because 
there are tables that hold six or eight or 12, you're also sitting with people that you've never met before. And so I've met people that had said, I became best friends with this person that sat next to me and that they scheduled to come to shows at the same time together. So there's a, I think it's, a, because there are no TV screens, nobody's watching a football game, nobody's distracted by a pool table. You're in, all in here for the very same reason. So it, it, the excitement is created just by everybody being there excited about seeing a show. Do we get that anymore? You know, I mean, yeah. like, we see everything on these, on the phones, and it's all close. And do we get the magic of, like, a live venue like this, being close? Yeah. Is that lost? Um, that is something that he, I remember Ellie in the morning on his TV show was talking about going to shows and holding up his iPad and filming a show. Seriously. I'm going to sit beside, behind somebody that's got an iPad up in the air. And I actually called his show. And I said, let me tell you something. If you did that in the Birch Beer, security would have you by your elbows and you'd be right out in the parking lot. And when you ask if you get your money back, the answer would be no. You're supposed to sit in there and watch this show. And you will find generally people do that. They may take some pictures, but you really don't see people in there videotaping the whole thing because they know that they're here to see the show. But you're right, I go to, I've been to concerts that I watch everybody recording the whole thing and I think, how you're not even enjoying this. You're so busy looking at your screen that you're not even really enjoying the, the point of this show, which is to sit back and relax and be entertained and be entertained. So, but you're right, everybody, every place you go, everybody's got their head stuck in a, in a phone. What do you want them to take away? Well, I, I, I know what they take away. First of all, they've had a great evening. They've had great food. One great thing about the Birchmere, aside from the fact that it's got great music, it has great food, and also the shows start early. So generally the shows start at 7.30. So people are out and home by sometimes 10 or 10.30 at night. And I mean, I've gone to concerts where the act comes on three hours late, and you can't be three hours late with me because I have to go to bed at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. So this is a perfect place for that because you get in early, you have good food, you have free parking, it's easy to get in and out of here. And so people go home feeling good. They don't walk out like a music venue that you go to where you have to walk blocks to get to your car and then go through a parking lot with a thousand cars in front of you and it takes forever to get out. It's just a really comfortable, easy venue. Susan, what do you want the next several decades and years to come in the future of the Birch Mirror to look like? What do you envision? I want it to look exactly like it looks today. I want it to be exactly the same with the same great people. And uh, the Alexandria Times had an article about um, Potomac Yard where they're talking about those different venues. And he said, um, maybe the Birchmere would want to move there. And I thought, no, no, because the Birchmere, without that huge mu mural that's painted on the outside of the, outside of the building and all the parking and the easy in and out, it wouldn't be the Birchmere. This is the Birchmere and it needs to stay exactly the way it is. So there, I, I, don't see any, I don't see any reason to move or change a thing. When you have something that works, if it's not broken, don't fix it.